when he talks about uh, all these other all these other issues as far as you can't get out of it, you're one crisis away. Well, hold on a second here. A lot of Asian Americans, statistically, they are out of it. And me saying that is why you created this segment. You've accused people who say that, that they're out of it, of being racist and using the model minority. You see the problem here? Yeah. There's, no way, there's no way out of it. You're going to have white people saying, look, Asians are doing well and cheering you on. Okay. Well, it seems to me like that's a way out of it. But if we point out that there's a way out of it, you accuse us of being racist. This is the thing. They need racism to be a modern boogeyman. And then they don't care about the collateral damage. <laughs> This is the model minority myth. John Oliver tries to take this on and then tries to, well, there, there are so many uh, fallacies here that I'm going to have to address them one by one. So um, he tried to argue against this perception of Asians as the model minority. Um, and of course, they predicate this on the idea that, look, when you see white Americans saying, hey, they're not racist, uh, for example, look at how successful Asians are and they have no problem with it. What, the, what that really is is racism. He actually tried to dispel this idea of the model minority myth, as he calls it, by using noted Asian, uh, 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 well, just Kamala Harris. Asian Americans can sometimes be oddly overlooked. A recent survey asked respondents to simply name a well-known Asian American, and the results were not good. 42% of people said that they don't know one. The next most popular answers were Jackie Chan, who's from Hong Kong, and Bruce Lee, who died in 1973. Oh, come on. No disrespect to Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee there, but that is embarrassing even before you consider. The poll was conducted while Kamala Harris, who's Asian American, was vice president. How do you f up a question that easy? Now, first off, this is a perfect example of trying to instill white guilt before the re right? Yeah, white yeah. guilt to begin with. Because most people are going, I guess, I guess I am racist. But you know what? A a hold on a second, John Oliver. Maybe people didn't think of Kamala Harris as uh, Asian uh, American because of Kamala Harris. Growing up, my sister and I had to deal with the neighbor who told us her parents couldn't play with us because she because we were black. Mm. <laughs> Good vibes. Looks like yoga. <laughs> Quite the fan dancer. Look at all those Asian Americans. <laughs> okay, do you have a favorite band or Yo -Yo favorite Ma. musician? I'd say one of my favorites is Bob Marley. Oh. Good choice. Uh, you can't go wrong with that. That's a no. crowd pleaser. Hard hitting question. On questions. your mixtape. What would be like your favorite three songs? Oh, okay, let's see. Um, I, Aretha Franklin, <laughs> um, uh, anything of Aretha Franklin. Um, I would say Bob Marley, and then, um, I don't know, I love Cardi B. Yeah, those aren't songs, <laughs> stupid. So this is the point that John Oliver tries to make, like, look at you. How did you not know that she was Asian American? Namely because she doesn't mention it unless it's politically convenient. Yeah. I'm sure she'll probably mention it with Chinese New Year, but then it'll be erased by her talking about Black History Month because she's going to place more emphasis on that. Uh, this is an argument that John Oliver makes uh, to try and make sure that, you know, uh, you're racist. Of course, a lot of Americans who are not racist, but who recognize that there are disparities between races in certain results. So, for example, academically, Asians tend to excel. Athletically, black Americans tend to excel, right? Recognizing those differences and maybe attributing some of them, for example, with Asians uh, and admissions, That's to culture... Point is in fact uh, not, po that's actually racist because that's not the case, says John Oliver. A central premise of the modern minority myth is that the key to overcoming American racism is simply strong values and hard work, with the implication being that groups that haven't succeeded simply haven't tried hard enough. As immigration law began selecting for skilled and educated Asian immigrants, the credentials of those new arrivals seemed to conform to the stereotype, which then took on a life of its own, especially in the civil rights era, as whites, unnerved by black Americans' radical challenges to the system, held up Japanese and Chinese Americans and their success as evidence that they claimed disproved systemic racism. Very basically, America prioritized wealthy, more educated Asian immigrants, then turned to black people who'd been subjugated for centuries and said, see, they're educated and successful, why aren't you? Okay, first off, you just if you say it with a lilt, 
you somehow uh, you act like it's an insane question. That's a perfectly reasonable question, actually. Let's be clear about that. Also, it, it actually sort of flies in the face of what he says later on in discussing Asian discrimination, which yeah. occurred actually uh, pretty recently, if you look at World War II. Bit. Anyway, uh, here's the thing. Why was the United States... Why was the United States able to find these highly skilled immigrants from Asia in the first place? Okay. Uh, it sh if we look at history, it shows us that culture is directly responsible for a lot of this. Let me give you a couple of examples. And it has nothing to do with melanin, Nick Cannon. Uh, a two-parent family, right? We've talked about this. Two-parent households, mom and dad. It's crucial. Crucial. It's actually, if we're going to talk about the single biggest determining factor in uh, your future success, um, Having a mom and having a dad and having them active in your life, it's not even close. When people talk about repairing the education system, when people talk about uh, fixing our welfare, our social safety net, nothing. If you did all of those things, if you spent our entire GDP yeah. on those things, on these Democrat policies since Lyndon Johnson up until now, on all of these ideas that the left have pushed as some kind of a solution to the racial disparities in the United States, it would not have a discernible difference on outcome when compared to having two parents in the household. We're talking about, so look, according to the United States, let me get some stats. Department of Justice, children from single parent homes uh, make up 71% of high school dropout, 75% of kids in drug treatment programs, 70% of state incarcerated juveniles. If you are actually wow. from a two parent household, you have a mom and you have a dad active in your life, and this can include step parents as well, uh, just to be clear, you are more likely to graduate school. You are less likely to be a criminal. You are more likely to be well-adjusted mentally. You are more likely to have a long-term relationship that's healthy as you get. It's, it's, it's the single greatest indicator that we have of future success for children. So culturally, this matters because Asian Americans, 85% of Asian American children grow up in two-parent households. Black Americans, 36%. Now, let me be clear about something. All references available at lotterwithcredit.com. When you say, oh, hold on a second, that's just right. No, no, look, look, we are talking about culture, two-parent household, because guess what? A black child with a two-parent household is still better off. All of the future indicators for that child, a black child with two parents is going to be better than a white or Asian child in a single-parent household, just to be clear. That's the beauty of it. It's just that there are so few black households in America where both mom and dad are active and taking a role in the life. It's very common. It's actually higher in Asian households than any other uh, minority group in the United States. Right, and so the cultural part of this, like I, this didn't, this wasn't always the case where African Americans had higher proportion of single parent families than right. everybody else, but they bought the lie that's been sold to them, and the black community did not stand up. And and I understand, like some people tried to, but it, they didn't stand up enough in force and say, look, this is going to hurt us for generations. This, like you said, is the single greatest indicator. We have study after study after study. It's not white men trying to control you. It's not white men trying to make sure that you do things the right way. It's saying this will be beneficial to you. And everything that we see from BLM and the left is attacking the nuclear family. BLM, it's on their charter. Why? It's no nuclear family. And by the way, just so you know, baby mama is actually, we use that term, right? Now people say baby mama. It's actually one of the few sort of cultural, I don't know, would you say idiom there? Would you say just cultural colloquialisms that stems from policy? It yep. stems from policy going back to Lyndon Johnson. It stems from the model cities. It stems from financially incentivizing single-parent households with welfare. That's the thing. Baby mama is actually the result of legislative policy, yeah. and it's a horrible thing to do to a child. Education. So we're yeah. talking about du dual parent households. Education. These are cultural examples. Do you believe that for some reason Asians, because of the color of their skin, stay together at a rate of 85% versus 36%? You want to say that that's because of race. Okay, you're the racist. Let's go on to education. Asian students spend four times as much time studying uh, as black Americans. They score an average of eight points higher on the ACT. Asian students have 13% higher high school graduation rates than black Americans. Do you want to say that's just because of their race? Now, here's the thing. Let's... Spoiler alert, no, okay? The reason... <laughs> <laughs> the reason that you see these numbers across the board, again, is because culturally this is very important and it's emphasized across uh, Asian cultures. Uh, Asian Americans value hard work and family yeah. 7 to 20 percent more than the general population, not just black Americans. Of course, that might have some kind of an impact on their success later in life. You may say it's just because of their race. Right, John Oliver? It's all race based. Chin cha, chin cha. I know what you're saying. Well, look, when a, I just think you're racist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when a culture starts to value things, right, and, and it can be a group of people, it can be a country, whatever it is, 
then people tend to go towards that, right? So um, Asians, they value like hard work and sticking to a problem. They've done studies on this as well with white kids. We tend and to strong give family up. Units. Yep, we tend to give up on math problems that are difficult after a, a, a shorter period of well, time. Math is Asians. racist. They'll sit there and they'll work on those because culturally they have been taught that there's benefit to doing that, right? So in the African-American community, athletics, do you think that black people are just more athletically gifted in, on, in mass than yes. everybody else? Yes, yes. I don't know. I'm not saying that that's true, but it is prized. It's true. It is prized. It's a way out. So many people well, have is, said though. it is a way out of what I grew up in, and so they put time and effort and energy into those things that they value. That's a good point, but right? they're also faster and they can jump high. Well, <laughs> Look, I don't know that that's true. <laughs> this is something uh, also that John Oliver does. And then he bitches about dividing and you know dividing people by racial groups. Uh, he says that we should not consider Asian Americans successful because there are certain subgroups of Asian Americans who are struggling, which is not wrong, but... Okay, just watch. One of the main dangers of treating Asian Americans as a single entity is that it obscures the reality of what is happening for the different subgroups inside it. For example, about 10% of Asian Americans live in poverty, which is actually lower than the overall US poverty rate. Yes. But when you disaggregate the data, when you break it down by subgroup, you start to see a much more complicated situation with Mongolian and Burmese Americans no, having a poverty rate of 25%, more than twice the national average. And when it comes to education, while around 75% of Indian Americans have a bachelor's degree well above the national average, for Bhutanese Americans, that figure is just 15%, which is well below it. The point is, disaggregating the data can reveal big disparities that you couldn't see previously. Oh, you mean see people as individuals, Oh, in this case you're still seeing them as a group, just uh, a subgroup of yeah. uh, uh, Asians. Let me be really clear before I get to the actual percentages to rebut it. Uh, this is where they are misguided. Do you know why there are certain groups, and this is not just with Asians, this is with immigrants of all kinds. The more recently someone immigrated to the United States, when you're looking at the family, the more likely they are to live in poverty. That's important to note. It means they haven't set their roots in the country here that allows prosperity to grow. So let me explain to you. Uh, vast majority of Asian Americans are what? Chinese, 24%. Indian, 21%. Filipino, 19%. Vietnamese, 10%. Uh, Korean, 9%. Japanese, 7%. Let's compare it to John Oliver's examples. Mongolians, less than 1%. And they're, annoy they're so annoying, the Chinese had to build a wall. The Burmese, 1%. <laughs> the Bhutanese, less than 1%. OK, if you look at the population for Mongolian, Burmese, Bhutanese Americans, most of that boom has occurred since 2000. Yeah. Okay? That, they're not behind because they're Mongolian. We love their barbecue. It's got the it's thing fantastic. and they do it and yes. it's fun. I put on an egg. Yeah. <laughs> the, key is to, the key is to put the meat in. Meat uh, first. You're right. Yes. The key is, yeah. Meat first. It's not fun. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta a little walk in a line and fill up my bowl and watch you cook it on a thing. Well, the food I want to sit in order. The time that you've been in this country, it's going to determine how much you have progressed as a group of people, like he said. But he's breaking down Asian and saying, "Well, these people are doing better. These people are doing better." The other factor is, oh, good. So you think that maybe culturally we should look at it and see, well, what is this culture prize? Yeah. Do these do these cultures tend to prize this the same way that maybe this other Indian culture does, or does do Japanese cultures pr yeah. you know prize this like Mongolian cultures? Yeah. We can actually look and see, John. You're making a great point that maybe cultures are a little different, and I'm not saying inferior or better. I'm saying that they prize things, they hold things to a higher esteem that maybe are more valuable. So, and that's something well, to look at to solve. But one the problem. thing you see across the board, for example, if we look at the the, the poverty rates of um, United you know natural born uh, Chinese American citizens versus foreign. Uh, foreign uh, born Chinese American, they're fifteen percent of them are in poverty. United States born nine percent, and you yeah. see this across a lot of populations. By yeah. the way, you see this with ha you know Haitian Americans who are born in the United States, uh, who have had families who've had roots. You see the same thing with Latino Americans. The, the determining factor, and isn't that a beautiful thing? But again, let's not talk about that because then that lets people know that America is a better country. Swedish, you've heard me well. talk about this many times when people point to the Nordic model. Swedish Americans, it's true. The average Swede has a higher uh, what they call a quality of living. There's a sort of an index that's created, right? A higher quality or standard of life than the average American. But Swedish Americans have a higher quality of life than Swedes in Sweden. Same thing for Danish Americans. Yeah. Well, when everything's given to you kind of for free, I mean, hey, uh, uh, do you like free stuff? Well, yeah. You take yeah, but then you <laughs> sell us particle board and make us put it together. Why would we like you? No, 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 no. Not particle so. board with steel IP. No, I'm in Ikea. <laughs> So well, maybe um, it's this. Maybe blacks and whites and a lot of us are born into America where we have certain freedoms and certain liberties and we kind of coast a little bit. 
where these people come from other countries where they've seen horrible surroundings yeah. and work their asses off to better themselves so they might do a little bit better because they try a little harder. They've seen Is real... Is that possible? Yeah. I mean... It could be real possible. poverty. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that's every case, but it's very possible. Also, Zach Morris did very well on his SATs. It's true. Oh, well. Not like that. Got into Slater, but he sits on that chair backwards, and my goodness, does he look cool. Now, uh, the earliest Asian American immigrants, like those from China, this is something also where John Oliver just, again, remember what he said before. Rewind this if you need to, because he was talking about how white Americans point to them because they haven't. Anyway, so the point is now he goes on to say, uh, and I agree, they've been discriminated against actually yeah. throughout this country up until pretty recently, too. Asian immigration in that time was essentially a cycle of economic exploitation followed by a violent and restrictive backlash. This began with Chinese immigrants who were recruited to work on the railroads in the 1860s. They faced virulent racism from the beginning, both from their bosses who saw their lives as disposable and from whites, many of whom saw them as unfair competition for jobs. So here's the thing. I completely agree. No one's saying that America has a spotless path. And I think it's important to recognize that it's not only black Americans who face discrimination here. Of course, Asian Americans have. You have people who aren't talking about the great, 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 great grandfather was a slave. You have people who they've seen their grandfather who was put in an internment camp. That is right. significant. Also significant, no racial group has faced systemic discrimination since the Civil Rights Act. Asian, black, or otherwise. So we now have enough of a data set. Now, let's go on to his next point because the show is going a little bit long. Um, he talks about how living up to the model minority stereotype inflicts psychological damage on uh, Asian Americans. Here he goes. Whether or not you're successful, living a life defined by a racist fantasy just isn't good for you. Yes. Striving to maintain the idea Our of a racist model fantasy minority is saying, hey, Asians has are doing really well. severed my yeah. self-esteem. I agree, but tell that to it Colbert really makes me feel that I'm Nothing more than someone who could get good grades, someone who was supposed to be perfect and be mum about everything. Right. What? Trying to be perfect your whole life is going to be too much to bear. That kind of pressure <laughs> can do real damage. Suicide is the leading cause of death for Asian Americans between the ages of 15 uh, and 24. I can't take the bullshit. Do you see the sleight of hand that just took place there? Yeah. Again, this is the problem with presenting facts, first off, without any context. Again, references available at lightearthcredit.com. We're trying, this segment has to be long because I think it requires context. I'm not trying yeah. to tell you, it's too complicated for me to explain. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to read up more on this. So check the references. Suicide um, is the leading cause of adolescent death. He says, you know, in the United States for Asian Americans. And he, of course, ties that to this idea that the model minority it's racist problem, three yeah. from the United States, yeah. basically, all of us white guys and uh, Asian men here, well, to yeah. wonder you're still alive, you made it through your yeah, teen years, and you were listening to emo. Combine Asian with My Chemical Romance, yeah. those wrists are spotless. And Here's, most of them do it with a sword if they get an A minus. Well, well. <laughs> they have a sword at the ready. We had a wooden spoon or a switch. Like, well. oh, did you get a, a B? Don't make me get a sword draw. Oh. I'm going to sword draw which one we I choose. You bring a much shame to the family. It's a worldwide issue. Yeah. It's not American Asians who commit suicide. So the leading cause of adolescent death is suicide in Korea, in Japan, in China, in Singapore. So again, what you see is a hybridizing. What you see is people bring a portion of their culture here to the United States. And they bring, by the way, both the good and the bad. They bring an industriousness. They bring uh, a value for the nuclear family, for family households. And they also bring societal pressure that leads to abnormally high suicide rates. It's the leading cause of adolescent death in those countries. And if you look at the top countries uh, as far as suicide rates, you always have Japan, Korea. They're always somewhere near the top, certainly as far as it relates to the industrialized world. Now, this pressure may come from the fact that there's a big honor culture in Asia, yeah. right? A lot of pressure to do well. Your family name means something. Ah, I think you get the point. Family. Where does this pressure come from? Is it random people off the street saying you're Asian, so you have to be smart? No, it's coming from the family. So, John Oliver, if the problem is the family, your whole argument goes away. Yeah, he wants you to believe that Andrew Yang makes a math joke, and then all yeah. of a sudden people yeah. are plummeting from rooftops. And this brings us to the final point where what they want to do, when you see this with the left, when you see this with John Oliver. Okay, and I'm making a generalization, but let me ask you this. Have you ever seen John Oliver, Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, Jimmy Kimmel, have you ever seen them do a segment? And, and, and I really do. I want you to comment, because correct me if I'm wrong, where they've said to any minority group, as we do regularly on the show, hey, you know what? 
some people have had some uh, some unfair breaks, and we get it. But the good news is you can do it, and the good news is you're actually not oppressed, and it doesn't have to continue that way. You live in the freest country yeah. in the world with the most upward mobility, and you know what? I believe in you. I don't think it's a racial issue. Have you ever seen them say that, or have you always seen them make generalizations based on race while then bitching about people who make generalizations based on race? So this is how he uh, ends up closing his segment, his lesson for you. And we're going to have some actual solutions here. I think some pragmatic solutions do matter, and they're pretty easy, simple stuff. Like John Oliver erect a statue in my honor. Simple things. <laughs> Asian Americans uh, continue to be oppressed, Mr. Oliver says. But there is no nice racism. There is no silver lining to it, and there is no working your way out of it. You are still perpetually treated as a foreigner, still asked where you're really from, and Asian Americans always seem to be just one geopolitical crisis away from becoming the targets of violence yet again. So the model minority myth is both a tool of white supremacy and a trap. Okay, so a couple of things here. Violence against Asians, okay. Where does that stem from? Over 85% of all physical assault crimes in the Bay Area, right? Liberal bastion of freedom, it's paradise. Take place at the hands of black Americans against Asian Americans. Could it be the soft on crime laws? When he talks about uh, all, these other, you know, all these other issues as far as you can't get out of it, you're one crisis away. Well, hold on a second here. A lot of Asian Americans, statistically, they are out of it. And me saying that is why you created this segment. You've accused people who say that, that they're out of it, of being racist and using the model minority. You see the problem here? Yeah. It's, there's, no way, there's no way out of it. You're going to have white people saying, look, Asians are doing well and cheering you on. Okay. It seems to me like that's a way out of it. But if we point out that there's a way out of it, you accuse us of being racist. This is the thing. They need racism to be a modern boogeyman. And then they don't care about the collateral damage. They don't care about the collateral damage of anti-Asian hate crimes that take place. They want to blame it on Donald Trump. They don't care about the collateral damage while they're discussing here later. He does a segment on affirmative action. Well, let's discuss that. Where's the collateral damage of affirmative action? The Supreme Court's going to be hearing a case on uh, Harvard and is it University of North Carolina? North Carolina. I think. Uh, there's a Harvard applicant, actually. This is a famous uh, story, if you haven't read up on it. Harrison Chen, who scored nearly a perfect SAT, graduated top of his class, and he wrote, they just lumped me into the Asian category, and the data quite clearly shows that admission officers were not willing to look at us as individuals. Do you have any idea how many bamboo chips that kid had shoved up his thumbs by his mom to get a perfect SAT mm -hmm. score? Well, look, not getting into Harvard's probably a silver, you know, there's silver lining to this thing. You're there's right, the debt. So, yeah, you know, you know. It's probably a good thing. You dodged a bullet. Hang out with the likes of Barack Obama and yeah. Ted Cruz. Oh, I'm a gag me with a chopstick. A hole. Yeah. You are not Harvard material <laughs> like Colin Joost. <laughs> 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 now, hold on a second, though. Where have we heard about, uh, you know, this, this uh, applicant, Harrison Chen? Where have we heard about lumping all Asians hmm. together before? I feel like... Hmm? One of the Earlier. main dangers of treating Asian Americans as a single entity is that it obscures the reality of what is happening for the different subgroups inside it. One of the dangers ah. of treating Asian Americans as a singular minority in also telling you that there's no way out, Asian Americans, for crying out loud, this is what happened. Yeah. Do you really believe that it's the right who's the party of divide and conquer? I mean, it's kind of like this, usually in a relationship, in a romantic relationship, okay? You end up, someone is either explosive, someone is either, you know, gets mad, or someone is incredibly manipulative. Someone who gets mad is not really all that clever. They can't control their emotions, so they're not capable of being manipulative. Yeah. This is the issue here. When they say Republicans, conservatives, look, they were the party of slavery. They were the party of the KKK, all of which is incorrect. Well, then they wouldn't really be able to tactfully find new ways of racism, like not admitting Asians into Harvard and Brown. That's you guys. You're manipulative. Well, they're racist towards the right groups, though, right? They're, they're racist towards white people. They're racist towards Asians. They're saying that black people, in this specific case, he's targeting black people and saying that they need to be able to have a leg up. They need affirmative action to be able to get into these universities, even though they don't match on the scores, potentially, right? Not all the right. time. And that's okay, and that's acceptable. But if you just say, look, I want to get rid of male, female, and race on any of these applications— they would say, no, 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 that's racist because you'll just end up with a bunch of Asian people and maybe some white guys in there as well. That's his entire That argument. sounds about right. Well, with John Oliver, he's like a, he's like a Reese's. There's no wrong way to be to racist. Be a <laughs>
So what do we need to do? Let me give you a couple of easy solutions. People say, well, what can we do about this? This, this issue is so complicated of race, and do we have more leniency from people who are in crappy neighborhoods? Do we spend more money? Well, hold on a second. You're going to throw more money at it because per people spending is higher in Detroit than on average. Yeah. Per people spending is very high in D.C., the worst schools in the country, yeah. than on average. More money doesn't help it. Okay. Are we going to say that, like you talked about, are we going to say that let, being more lenient on admissions is going to help? Well, no, because then we see the highest dropout rates for black Americans who get through uh, affirmative action. You know, Basically, they're used to meet certain racial quotas, and then they end up falling behind, and then that ends up having a worse economic outlook. They end up with a worse economic outlook. Mm -hmm. So those things don't work. Here are some simple solutions when we talk about where we can start. Okay? First off, we've been talking about immigration here in this country. We've been talking about getting people here. We're talking about Asian Americans. First, let's have a national language. Okay, let's have a national language. Let's have some criteria for immigrants who come to this country because we want immigrants who come to this country to actually have the best chance possible to be successful Agreed. and their children to flourish. Okay, what else do we do? Let's have some policy that encourages two-parent households. Here's the thing. If you believe that taxation, if you believe that economic policy, particularly fiscal policy as it relates to taxation, is a good manipulator of behavior. This is what the left believes. This is why they want to tax cigarettes. This is why they want to tax big gulps for crying out. This is why they want to tax gasoline more. This is why they want a carbon tax. If you believe that, then you would have to acknowledge that the inverse is true. Let's, let's continue to provide some economic incentives to reward people who, are to, uh, who, who create and foster a two-parent household in a nuclear family, as opposed to trying to destroy it like Black Lives Matter. Oh, again, people you align yourselves with. Uh, and let's also have some, you know what, not have some laws. Let's eliminate all laws on the books that exist right now to incentivize in any way, shape, or form single parent households. So that means the welfare laws, that means the EBT laws, that means the laws that created a baby mama, that means laws that say, oh, you know what, you get two welfare checks if you're not officially married, but if you're a couple, you only get one. Let's get rid of, so it's that simple, national language, let's incentivize two parent households, and not only that, culturally, let's try and start celebrating it a little bit, and let's get rid of all laws that exist on the books that could even possibly incentivize the opposite, single parent households. You start with that, that's gonna do a whole lot more than double the per pupil spending or doubling the amount of black Americans who are accepted into Harvard, which means that you will get half the amount of qualified Asians who are accepted into Harvard, regardless of how much money you throw at it. There's a starting point. There's a solution. If you agree, look, you can comment below. You can smash that like button. We're going to continue talking about this in a way that we can't talk about on YouTube because they'll just accuse you of being racist. Right. And we're going to play newest gender pronouns. So YouTube, you can piss off. Watch Louder with Crowder live Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern.